What's going on, guys? It's Illuminostic. Sorry about the delays. I had scheduled this stream several times, and I just kept pushing it back and pushing it back because we are getting ready to go to Banos to meet a couple more guests, uh, people that are coming to the retreat. Um, so super stoked about that. I love going to Banos. I love the Tungorahua volcano. Um, we, uh, if people opt for that part of the package, we uh, meet them in Quito. Uh, so you have airport service, and then we go to Banos and rent an ATV and take it up to the, um, oh, what do you call it? The part of the volcano that blows off. <laughs> Uh, there's a zoo kind of affair on the way down, um, like a petting zoo. Uh, really great. Banos is just amazing. Devil's Cauldron waterfalls are awesome. So um, I have popped on here to talk to you guys about the changes in consciousness that occur uh, when people take psychedelics, particularly it seems um, DMT or ayahuasca. Uh, I think all psychedelics have the... Um, capacity to cause these kinds of changes in the brain. I think that we know basically the mechanisms that are behind it, although they haven't um, necessarily been specifically identified, but there is sort of a consensus uh, that there are some sort of filters in the nervous system um, that filter or reduce the amount of information uh, that's incoming, uh, mostly in the forms of various types of radiation. So uh, light and EMFs, and they filter it down to something that is more uh, manageable. And so what happens, I think, with a lot of people, um, there, there are two sort of extreme versions of this uh, sort of phenomena, I guess. Um, on the one hand, you have people that are coming from a place of postmodern deterministic reductionism, and um, so you know, it's just all blind matter, gobbledygook, it's random chance, evolution is a matter of blind chance, there's no, not even, not, not just agnostic, but this sort of absolute unflexible belief that there is um, no intelligence even that is integrated into nature somehow. And so, when this type of person has a psychedelic experience and then they come back expecting their life and their experience of life to be the same as it was before and then it's not, they think that something has gone terribly wrong, that they've been driven insane. Um, and, you know, you guys, I think we've all learned a lot about propaganda and conditioning and um, the effect and influence that that can have on people. Uh, and so, especially, I think, for older generations that were really, really bombarded with drug war. What's going on, Charles? Oh, by the way, you guys, you were right about the Facebook link um, and the Patreon secret stream. So I'm going to make new links uh, and and post them from my email um, so that it doesn't go through Facebook so that you guys that have missed those secret streams that have been banned from Facebook can um, check them out. Uh, so uh, for the older generations that have been absolutely bombarded by um, that drug war propaganda, there's this deep-seated uh, belief that psychedelics can make you insane. Um, and so when you take them and then afterwards you're having experiences of synchronicity, precognition, or even just awareness of energy in a way that is um, abnormal to you, uh, people think that they flipped the switch. Um, on a kind of side note, I think a lot of the people that claim the hyper-persistent perceptual disorder are actually just seeking attention. Um, I've gone through a lot of those videos and kind of dissected the stuff that they're saying, and it's almost definitely complete bullshit. Um, so I think in the cases where it's people legitimately thinking that they have permafried themselves, it's actually uh, just that they have expanded their consciousness and they weren't expecting that. Um, they don't believe that that's a thing. So when they experience it, they just think that there's something wrong. And um, that's something I think that is uh, largely absent from a lot of uh, integration protocols because uh, people are trying to rehabilitate the image of psychedelics. They're trying to um, not present themselves as wackos um, or people that are 
uh, even thinking outside of the box because surprise, surprise, even progressive thinkers and people that have escaped the matrix and think that they are actually becoming critical thinking free thinkers are deluded. Uh, in reality, what people generally do is they get out of escape one narrative and they just climb right into another box. Um, and so they think they've been liberated, but all that really happened is that they have just chosen a different religion. Um, really kind of an unfortunate circumstance because then what happens is that the growth and the change and the healing and all of this amazing stuff that was possible and even probable is limited again. Uh, and that's extremely unfortunate. So, um, now let's completely look at the other side of the coin, which is the woo element. One of the most unfortunate, um, side effects or, um, collateral consequences, uh, of the, reemergence of shamanism and and the popularity of ayahuasca and various psychedelics is that there is a whole lot of stone age woo that has come with it and um so that's not helpful either uh when you have people that are deeply traumatized they have uh you know almost always a uh, huge insincerity complexes um, I'm not insincerity, excuse me, that's a terrible word to use, um, self, um, self-confidence issues, um, and, uh, so when you have a person with that sort of disposition and then you, they suddenly believe that spirits are real and not only that spirits are are parasitical entities that survive negative energy. Um, I I think that you know those people first of all have a really wonky understanding of what energy even means. Um, damage, trauma, uh, that's not energy. Um, if anything, it's the absence of energy. Uh, energy is like potential that has symmetry. Right, so that it can function and have some mechanism of expression. And so, uh, personally, I don't believe in negative parasitical ent entities or that type of spirit. Um, some people argue, like, well, you know, the shamans say that there are arrows, negative arrows, that they suck out of people, even if that's true. And I'm quite sure that it is, that the, there are shamanic methods um, that can effectively um, change the energetic, uh, state of a person. Um, shaman don't actually believe that those are entities. They believe that they were put there by people who had ill will against the person that is suffering from them. How's it going? Been drifting. Um, so that's actually not true. And I've actually spoken with a lot of shaman from different tribes and generally, um, there isn't even a word for bad spirit. So, um, the unfortunate reality is that a lot of new age ideas that I don't think hold water at all, um, have sort of seeped into this movement. And I think that, you know, we have uh, an environment of toxic positivity where, you know, it, people are very much discouraged to be critical of each other. Um, uh, I'm doing really well, um, they are, you know, people just accept and believe everything. Once the mind is open, now everything is real. Everything beyond the normal matrix conception of what reality is, it's all real. It's all true. Um, and I think that that is, you know, that's kind of the opposite side of the spectrum of, you know, the abject materialist whose consciousness is expanded. Now, now he's having experiences that he can't explain, can't easily come to terms with. On the other side of that, we have the suddenly superstitious, uh, so open-minded that wind is whistling through our ears, muddle-headed mystic, um, that whole thing. Uh, so either way, what we have is a psychedelic crisis on our hands. And um, to add almost insult to injury, uh, we have an absolute flood of hippies with no never read even, you know, the fringe psychology standards like Jung and, um, 
uh, Gurdjieff even, you know, no research, no study, no training, no nothing, not really qualified to tie their own shoes. And I happen to know a number of them because um, I hate to call it the ayahuasca industry, but I do work in the uh, ayahuasca industry of the medicine space. That's how we label things also um, so that they don't sound like what they actually are um, to make it nicer and fluffier. Uh, so that people can imagine that life is all about blowing lines of fairy dust and huffing unicorn farts. Um, I mean, you know, I'm being serious, really. It's, uh, it's the ayahuasca industry. And the same people that like to relabel it medicine space um, present a very rosy, uh, you know, from their social media presence, you would think that their life is just amazing, that they're just on top of the world, that there's no problems anywhere. And, you know, I'm upstairs watching them have a nervous breakdown every single night. And, um, uh, you know, and this is the norm. This is the average. This is like the majority of people. And because there isn't really a standard to measure this against, I think a lot of them actually thrive because nobody really knows any better. Uh, this is new territory, and, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of reform that is necessary. And I think one of the perfect places to focus is always the middle road, right? In the hermetic tradition, there used to be this idea of, um, of a left-hand path and a right-hand path and then the middle way. Right, so you weren't a unicorn fart huffing um, new age crystal cruncher, and you also weren't an evil black magician living only for yourself. You could walk the middle road. Uh, most adept initiates at this point say the middle road is gone, and you have to choose sides uh, because of the sort of crisis. Um, totally off the topic, sort of. Um, but the reality is that there's you know, this is applicable to uh, the circumstance of psychedelic integration and understanding uh, how consciousness can change and how we can uh, integrate that experience without uh, the fear that we've lost our minds and without reverting to uh, superstitions that don't serve us and have no validity or pragmatism inherent in them. Um, there is a middle way. And uh, this is not so hard as you would imagine. It's just really about uh, having courage and um, remembering that the most complete set of talents and virtues is totally useless in the absence of willpower and discipline. And so we must regain our capacity for critical thought. Uh, I think that no seed can really um, flourish in, uh, unless there's fertile soil. And it's my belief that the society that we all have been sort of cultured in uh, has abandoned, um, to put it mildly, uh, teaching critical thinking. Um, and so we have to take responsibility for training our own mind and developing habits of mindfulness and to have the courage to apply skepticism and critical thinking and to challenge our friends as long as it's done in a um and narratives you know narratives coming from our friends uh as long as it's done in a productive manner you know with good intent um and if we are able to strike a balance between open-mindedness and skepticism we may have some hope of actually walking in the truth and so far as I can tell, the truth is that the universe is indeed uh, sentient. In fact, in, it seems to me to be basically somehow made of consciousness, made of awareness itself. Um, and so it's not blind, uh, deterministic uh, re reductionism, you know, it's, it's, it's not that. Uh, there is more to the universe than that. But... Are there parasitical spiritual entities feeding on your weaknesses? No, you're just blame shifting. Uh, you know, it, you, you have to take responsibility for yourself. Um, a great analogy for this uh, is the, the vampire, 
Um, the vampire is said to not be able to come into your house and feed on you unless you give it permission, right? And so this belief in these parasitical entities is uh, it's akin to giving a vampire permission to come and feed on your energy. Um, I've put myself in all sorts of uh, vulnerable spaces if these things had reality to them. And uh, I, I have not been able to detect any kind of uh, malice from any of the DMT entities um, that I've encountered or seen any evidence of uh, any reality to some of the more superstitious beliefs that people have generated to try to explain their experiences of what I call the universal mind. Um, so, you know, that is our task now and in the psychedelic community and the plant medicine community um we have to come to terms with a new understanding of the universe uh you know one that does not permit um what amount to toxic superstitious beliefs um limiting uh well let's just call them toxic super superstitious beliefs or uh, these sort of absolute, um, dogmatic, fear-based belief in the absolute absence of any kind of intelligence or awareness in nature, because that belief is really limiting. And the truth is that, you know, and this is something that lots of people have noticed over thousands of years, it's not just my opinion, it seems, um, seems that if people are able to suspend our normal consciousness, whether it's through meditation or psychedelics, or even, you know, improvisational music, or, you know, there are lots of paths uh, to this place. Some of them I think more efficacious than others, and certainly best to combine as many as possible um, and take advantage of all the tools in the toolkit, um, to paint with all of the colors uh, on the palette, and to mix them together and create new ones. But you get, get my point that... Um, there are, are there is a consensus uh, regarding the effect of uh, the suspension of our normal modality of consciousness uh, on our being, and um, it seems to also be a consensus that that effect is generally good. Um, some people have pointed out that the psychedelic route may be a little bit more dangerous than, say, meditating, um, and I would agree. It's also much faster. Uh, and also no, not everyone gets a result from meditating and generally everyone gets a result from psychedelics. It is, uh, a totally fair analogy to say, you know, if you want to ride your bicycle across the country, uh, at, you know, what would you say an average of 15 miles per hour or something like that? Um, it's going to be a lot slower than if you were to drive a Lamborghini across the United States. If you crash the bicycle, you might scrape your knee. If you crash a Lamborghini, you're going to die. So you have to be able to assess yourself and say, you know, am I a Lamborghini person or a bicycle person? If you're a bicycle person, may as well stick to the bicycle. If you're a Lamborghini person, more power to you. Um, and those people that say that, you know, shouldn't you be able to do these things without a chemical? Um, I, I don't understand the logic. You can't breathe without chemicals. You can't think without chemicals. You can't feel without chemicals. Uh, you cannot, you know, uh, shouldn't you be able to go to the moon without a space shuttle? I mean, um, or go to the bottom of the ocean without a submarine? Um, I don't, I don't understand that argument. I, I don't even understand it. It's, it's just this sort of archaic, um, sort of it's, it's, it's matrix mind limiting thinking. Uh, and you know, the reality is that if you, buckle your seatbelt in the Lamborghini, if you maybe wear a helmet, if you're really planning on driving it at full speeds, if you have some training before you get in the car, uh, you have a much better chance of handling the corners at 200 miles per hour. Um, so there are all these precautions and, uh, uh, you know, training that you can have to really maximize these things safely. Um, but I digress. I think that, uh, there are a lot of unfortunate circumstances in our world at large right now. Um, we're all dealing with a tremendous amount of existential anxiety. I think much of the world is suffering from a tremendous crisis of purpose. 
Uh, China has escalated tensions with the U.S. in the last couple of days. Russia has made very specific threats about, you know, creating a... Um... <laughs> right on, Vinny. Uh, about exactly how it's going to nuke Britain out of existence, for example, with the, um, the, the nuclear tsunami. Um, you know, the economic troubles are the worst that they've ever been. And no one really is predicting that it's going to get any better before it gets a lot worse. Um, so, you know, we have all of that sort of existential stuff weighing down on us. And then we also have our own obligation to our own inner journey and our own self-improvement and the realization of our dreams and, the, you know, catalyzing our consciousness and trying to maintain our trajectory in a positive and productive way through an ocean of chaos when no one knows where we're going, where we've come from, what we're doing. Um, you know, we are certainly uh, having our, our third eyes pried open um, just in time, potentially, to witness the emanation of the eschaton and the end of history. Um, it's really, really intense. And uh, so when you have a bunch of fear-enhanced um, desperate people, you know, um, all trying to become medicine facilitators and integrators, uh, you know, we have potential for a lot of even well-meaning sort of disastrous consequences. Um, so I think really the best thing that we can do is to try to take as much responsibility for our own journey as possible. And that really requires us to develop our capacity to concentrate and meditate. There is nothing that is going to aid you in the, in the psychedelic space when things get difficult, when your consciousness starts to melt down, than having confidence that you have developed the capacity to remain calm and concentrating uh, throughout um, any sort of circumstances. Uh, that is skill number one. Um, and one of the main ways that we have to regulate our emotional being is by regulating our breath. So if you want to kill like 10 birds with one stone, um, pranayama, pranayama, pranayama. For mind and body alike, there is no purgative like pranayama, pranayama, pranayama. Make that a mantra. For mind and body alike, there is no purgative like pranayama, pranayama, pranayama. Just keep saying it over and over and over again. If you pray long enough with your lips, you will begin to pray with your heart, um, or so I've been told. But seriously, pranayama is a tremendous tool. And when you're in those moments, uh, in a psychedelic experience where you have achieved some state of clarity or a feeling of being empowered or, you know, uber creative or whatever it is that you have attained to, uh, that you wish to retain, uh, there is nothing that is going to facilitate that like pranayama. Um, when we take psychedelics, our neuroplasticity is uh, greatly enhanced, meaning that the brain can create new neural uh, pathways uh, much more easily than normal and its normal state. And neurogenesis is off the charts. So we actually have new brain cells, new neuropathways forming uh, with psilocybin. It's been proven that these damaged um, brain cells, uh, they kind of shrivel up if you have been an alcoholic or drug addict or depressive um, for a long time, uh, brain cells actually will shrivel up. And what happens when you take psil psilocybin is that they sort of blow back up like balloons and go right back to work. So if you want to take advantage of this biological um, uh, uh, state, uh, this really advantageous biological state uh, that the brain is in during the psychedelic experience, you have to somehow take a snapshot of the energetic state or emotional state or psychological state that you're trying to bring with you out of the experience. And so the best way to do this is pranayama, where we're breathing in for, say, a four count. Four is really easy. Um, so four in, hold for four, breathe out for four, keep it distended for four, while uh, on the in-breath, focusing on that which you wish to retain, and on the out-breath, focusing on that which you wish to dispel. Uh, I quit smoking in two hours using 100 micrograms of LSD using this. Um, it, it absolutely works. It's absolutely uh, um, simple. Um, so that is, that is uh, you know, as far as techniques that you need to bring into the space with you, that would be number one um, in my book. 
And, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of time left, so I need to kind of condense the rest of this information into something, um, concise, uh, pranayama, pranayama, pranayama. <laughs> um, and so with preparation, you know, uh, everybody knows about mindfulness, but the reality is that if you really can train your mind to constantly analyze why you're doing what you're doing, um, and to have an awareness of, um, your own thoughts and your actions. And, uh, and you also have to find the time to trace these things back to their original catalysts when they are not consistent with what you want to see from your, uh, behavior. Um, you know, you have to have a, uh, basic working knowledge of the techniques of psychoanalysis, uh, that you, you can do this on yourself. You can keep a dream journal in the Hermetic Order, the Golden Dawn, and other uh, uh, schools of magical thought. Um, some might call them secret societies or fraternities. Uh, it, every, every single neophyte has to keep a journal where you keep track of, of every dream. As soon as you wake up, you have to write down everything that you can remember from your dreams. Um, and then as you progress, when you look back over it, you will find all sorts of remarkable stuff, um, that you have sort of made a map of your subconscious and really the, uh, the path to really healing yourself is to create a bridge between the subconscious and the conscious mind. Something like 80% of our behavior, uh, yeah, discipline the hind mind, like Jonah said, um, something like 80% of our behavior by some estimates, it's more like 90 uh, is subconscious. So if you can create a relationship an awareness, uh, a, a, a bridge between the subconscious and the conscious mind, um, you are doing a lot of good for yourself. And that dream journal is an excellent way to go about it. Uh, some ritual work like the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram combined with the middle pillar. Um, I have videos about how to do this stuff. There's lots of great tutorials online. If you are interested, you can come to our retreat and I will teach you how to do it in person. Um, by the way, you guys hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon, or there are Zelle, PayPal, and, um, crypto wallets in the description and in the chat. We're demonetized. So I get nothing for doing this. You guys will notice that nobody can ever send, um, the super chat donations, uh, because they don't exist when you're demonetized. So we really do appreciate support. Um, and we are still having our, uh, plant medicine, hermetic magic retreats, uh, in Ecuador. Um, they're very easy to customize because we're having very small groups. So, uh, I can teach you about plant medicine and techniques of shamanism and hermetic magic and, um, a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and also we have a local indigenous shaman and shamana like Mama Celia, who was actually is the, uh, shamanic ambassador, um, for, uh, Ecuador chosen by the government, uh, to represent the shamans of Ecuador. She's 45 minutes away. And, uh, we include a visit with her, uh, in our, our, uh, retreat. Um, we also have Ishi and Amiruka, uh, community, uh, where they teach, um, Quechua language and customs and plant medicine. They do ayahuasca ceremonies. We have Tapir Island nearby where there are a few of the only 2,500 tapirs left, which is sort of like a cross between a horse and a rhinoceros. Uh, looks more like an elephant horse pig or something. Uh, but the last time we went to Tapir Island, uh, the tapir came out of the bushes right when I said, like, I hope we see a tapir and walked right up to one of our guests um, and that was mind blowing, but apparently the top ears are friendly, uh, which explains why there's so few of them <laughs> and there are spider monkeys. And then we have lagoons with caiman and all sorts of different types of monkeys and these giant paiche fish that come up, to let you pet them and, um, really an amazing place. Uh, so, uh, you can send me an email if you're interested in that. Okay, so somebody's talking about dreams, and speaking of our retreat in plant medicine, Guayusa, uh, which is available in the United States, although uh, it's going to be a lot more expensive, unfortunately. We have trees of it all over the place, so it's, it's pretty cheap. But um, 
the quichua women uh, actually make a very strong tea with it. So you want to cook it until it's like, um, you know, in the U.S., people will put a few leaves in a cup like they're making tea and drink that. And that's not that's not why you said it wants you want it to look like tobacco juice, like like ayahuasca, like brown, thick. I mean, not thick in consistency, but dark brown. Um, and it's, it's got tremendous, tremendous, tremendous healing capacity. It is absolutely central to the lives of the indigenous people here. And one of the consequences of drinking a lot of it is supposed to be lucid dreaming and enhanced dreaming. So if you have stopped smoking marijuana, which I absolutely would encourage you to do, uh, you're definitely impeding your development. If you're smoking too much pot, um, you can bring those dreams back to life by drinking lots and lots of guayusa. Uh, the Quechua women, as I was saying, get up at 4.30 in the morning, they drink a whole bunch of it, and then they talk about their dreams because the dreams of the women are, um, you know, like the, one of the main guides for the communities. Still to this day, uh, right down the street here from where we're living, the whole community meets all the women at 4.30 in the morning. And uh, they're also drinking guayusa uh, as soon as they start having these conversations. Um, Pot and DMT, a wise combination. Uh, it actually doesn't really make any sense. I mean, it's not that it's going to hurt you. Uh, it's just that DMT is just going to absolutely overwhelm the marijuana. And, um, you know, if anything, I think if you're going to smoke it, uh, that then having a little bit of marijuana may smooth the physical roughness of the transition, transition between the normal state and the DMT state. Um but other than that, you know, there's not a lot of reason. Uh, I, I generally don't advocate any use of marijuana with psychedelics because it's sort of counterproductive, I think. Um, although it should be noted that the, uh, what is that, Daimo, Santo Daim or something, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but the, the ayahuasca church in Brazil, um, they smoke marijuana at the end of all ayahuasca ceremonies the quichua shaman i spoke to the other day called marijuana a uh, sister to um, ayahuasca um, but you know there are definitely varied opinions as to whether or not that that makes sense it's certainly not dangerous if that's your question um you know i was going to share a few stories from the last week or so of of drinking ayahuasca and then immediately experiencing these tremendously specific uh, coincidences and sort of answers, you know, we'll open the ceremony by, by making a sort of prayer uh, about our intention and our wishes and the things that we hope to, to, to glean from the ceremony um, or guidance from the spirits, the universal mind. And, um, Oh, I think it's been maybe seven or eight years now. Um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't saying that I think that, you know, marijuana ruins psychedelic experiences, but I think it can kind of blunt the mind. And what we want uh, is to be sharpening the mind during these experiences. So, you know, I think smoking a, 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 some cannabis towards the end of a psychedelic experience to kind of smooth out the transition and, and taper, uh, I think that's, um, I think that's probably wise. Uh, but I, what I was, what I was saying is that I was going to talk about some of these experiences, but, um, this has gone on for much longer than I expected. And I'm much more tired than I expected. And I, realize that speaking of marijuana, I almost feel stoned, like I'm getting a bit loopy. Um, so, and I have to travel tomorrow and I have a few other things I have to do to get ready. So I should probably, uh, sign out. See, look how long it took me to think of, of signing out. Um, so that is, you know, to, to sort of summarize everything, it's, It's about walking the fine line um, between a, a hard-nosed scientific skeptic and an open-minded um, spiritual mystic. These things are not mutually exclusive. 
Um, and it is not the kind of fire and water combination that a lot of people think. Um, and I, I think that when spirituality can become damaging, it's because in the same way that scientifically oriented people are afraid that spirituality is going to corrupt their ability to think rationally, uh, so they reject it entirely, making a huge mistake and limiting the experience of life uh, and reducing it to uh, a very meaningless experience, which is probably the worst, the most tragic aspect of that. You know, on the other end of the spectrum, we have the people that are subconsciously afraid that they are going to destroy their woo if they are thinking skeptically and being rational and, you know, trying to uh, come up with numerous explanations for every experience that they have that challenges uh, the matrix model, um, you know, and really, if you don't do that, you're doing a disservice to yourself, you're doing a disservice to the entire movement, because that's what's necessary. Uh, when I have memories from a past life, for example, even if I'm able to confirm that it's definitely information that I didn't have access to that is absolutely accurate, I still don't know whether it can be accounted for by um, assuming the existence of a universal mind or uh, if I have uh, an ancestor um, that could be linked to that person. We know that there's genetic memory. you know. So when you have these experiences, you can't just collapse the probability wave on this one possibility because that's not good protocol and we have to learn to navigate our spiritual experience with the same kind of discernment uh that would allow us to succeed in the material world and the fact that we don't think we have to do that really speaks volumes about the lack of respect uh for you know, really, truly advanced mystics and shaman and magicians or, you know, however you want to label them that we have had in, you know, not just tribal societies, but going back to, uh, you know, Europe hundreds of years ago. Um, and you could say that that respect was misplaced, except if the heads of state, the kings and the queens uh, of... France and England and other empires, but especially England, um, were the, the main advisor to the head of state, the queen, the king, whoever it was, was a magician. And so if they were giving faulty advice, explain to me how these people took over the fucking world. I mean, you know, you guys, speaking of critical thinking... We have to really look at the history books and um, evaluate what's there, uh, because oftentimes um, the lies and the misdirection uh, are so blatant um, that it really doesn't take too much analysis to realize uh, the truth. And the same can be said for the blind spots that we create in our own history of our own lives. And until we learn to look in those places uh, where um, to shine light where we have either, either been unwilling or unable historically, we will fail to shine light in those places in the future as well. And so, you know, that analytical aspect of mysticism and the scientific rigor of, you know, systems like scientific illuminism and hermetic magic, uh, we really need to learn how to integrate those things um, as we uh, sort of rejoin uh, the stream of consciousness um, from the blind matter deterministic reductionist uh, postmodern bullshit with the Stone Age superstitious, <laughs> you know what I mean? We have got to strike a balance. Um, and then we can really truly make a meaningful contribution uh, to our own lives and to 
a movement, a really, truly productive, unified, powerful movement that has the capacity to really blaze a new trail forward for humanity. Um, after, of course, the uh, nuclear winter blows away and we can all come out of our caverns again. Um, so thank you guys so much for spending this time with me. I'm going to be on the road for a couple of days and then hopefully Wednesday or Thursday uh, I, I can jump back on. Do hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon, or you can send a one-time contribution to Zelle or PayPal or our crypto wallet because we're demonetized and we get nothing. Hopefully you guys make it to our retreats. Um, and thank you guys so much again for watching. We'll see you again soon.